Thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Crystalborn Heroes of Fate, a free to download fast paced dynamic RPG. Use our link in the description to download it now on iOS and Android. This might be the most ambitious mobile RPG in history, and we can't stop playing it. In Crystalborn, you assemble a team of up to six heroes, each with unique abilities like calling in a destructive whirlwind or summoning an airship with a giant laser beam to blast your enemies from the sky. There's over 100 heroes, and each has an inventory with tons of items to equip and upgrade, so you can truly customize your team and make it your own. There's an easy to understand rock paper scissors approach to combat, and we've spent hours crafting the perfect team to take on monsters and other players in PvP. Our favorite hero by far is Maelstrom, an epic hero who can do devastating damage to all enemies at once, plus he just looks really cool. With an engaging campaign that will take you across war-torn realms and a guild conquest mode where you team up with other players to take and hold territory, there's always something new to explore or someone to fight. Join us in Crystalborn Heroes of Fate, where we're using the name Infographics and climb the ranks with us. Use our link in the description to download it on iOS and Android right now. He had the piercing stare of a viper, was seen as a sexual deviant, and some called him the devil or the antichrist, and Felix Yusupov, a Russian prince and aristocrat, knew he must be stopped. It would take poisoned wine and a bullet to the head, followed by a plunge into the icy Neva River, to at last end the life of one of Russia's most controversial figures, the Mad Monk, otherwise known as the Unkillable Rasputin. Grigory Yefimovich Novik was born on January 21, 1869, to a family of peasants in Pokrovskoy, a tiny village in Siberia near the Tura River. His mother had seven other kids before Rasputin came along, but some died as babies or during childhood. Rasputin's siblings, who survived past childhood, were named Dmitri, Maria, and Varvara. There might have been a ninth daughter named Theodia, though. His dad, Yefim, was a peasant farmer with a side gig of being a diplomatic courier, a fancy way of describing transporting people and goods between Tobolsk, his small town, and Tumin, a larger nearby city. Rasputin was considered a strange kid growing up. People in his village thought he could have visions and heal people. One record details how a young Rasputin was once sick in bed, and a group of peasants came to see if he could point out who of them had stolen a horse. He rose up out of bed and pointed to the one who was guilty. Turns out he had pointed to the right guy, because the accused was seen taking the horse out later that night. According to the book Rasputin A Short Life, while this astonished the villagers, people were wary of him, thinking he might be possessed by the devil. He also had the ability to calm hysterical animals. According to the crime books, big ideas simply explained. At this time in his youth, though, he was more notoriously known for stirring up trouble, being accused of getting into fistfights, drinking too much, and sexually assaulting girls in the village. He married Proskova Fyodorovna Dubrovina when he was just a teenager. Exactly what age, though, is unclear. And they had four kids, but he cheated on her with women from all classes of society, from prostitutes to women of higher social standing. He stumbled upon a monastery at Vekateria when he was 23 and trained to be a monk, eventually failing to become one though. It was here that he also taught himself how to read and write and eventually went on his own way. He became a wanderer who roamed to holy cities in Jerusalem and Greece, subsisting off of donations. His nomadic existence got him the name Stranik which roughly translates to wanderer of religious or pilgrim in Russian. He eventually encountered the Kalisti Flagellant sect, a breakaway of the Russian Orthodox Church. This sect was a cult that believed in achieving holy passionlessness or exhausting themselves through physical activities, like praying, dancing, and spinning. They also did this with sex, partaking in orgies. Rasputin simply called all these activities driving out sin with sin. His wanderings also took him to St. Petersburg, Russia, and this was where his fame took off. After gaining attention for his religious zeal and charisma from the Russian Orthodox clergy and members of the imperial family, they introduced him to Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Alexandra. Their son Alexei, who was heir to the throne, had hemophilia, a hereditary condition that causes a person's blood to not clot normally and then leads to excessive bleeding. This disease can lead to death if not treated or if it starts in the brain. Tsarina was panicked that he'd die before assuming his position. Rasputin came to the boy's aid and reportedly spoke some prayers, was at his bedside, and Alexei recovered, despite the doctor's grim prognosis that he'd likely die from his condition. In addition to being Alexei's healer, he also served as the family's spiritual advisor, being called their holy man, and was revered as a prophet. Alexandra went so far as to say she believed God spoke to her through Rasputin. Rasputin's rendezvous with the royal family did not go without rumors and scandal. 
There was talk that there was an affair happening between Rasputin and Alexandra, but historian Douglas Smith, who wrote the book Rasputin, Faith, Power, and the Twilight of the Romanovs, dismisses these, saying in an interview, there is no truth to the stories about Rasputin and the Empress Alexandra having been lovers. Alexandra was quite a prudish Victorian woman. There's no way and no proof that she would ever have looked to Rasputin for sex. Smith further thought that people spreading those rumors were mainly politically motivated. One side that wanted revolution and the overthrow of the Romanovs spread those stories to make the royal family look corrupt, while the other half thought their dealings with Rasputin were dangerous and that Rasputin himself was dangerous. Smith also has his thoughts on what happened during Rasputin's so-called healing sessions with Alexei. He believed that instead of Rasputin having mystical healing powers, his presence by the boy's bedside influenced him to get better. Other historians think his mother being calmed by his presence in turn made Alexei calm, which had a healing effect. Then some postulate that him deterring the boy from being seen by doctors helped because they'd given him aspirin, which would thin his blood and worsen his condition. Rasputin served as Alexei's healer again in 1912 after he developed a hemorrhage in his thigh and groin regions when he was on a carriage ride and it jolted. This caused him to develop a hematoma that resulted in pain and fever. Certain this would kill him, his mother asked Anna Virobova, a Russian lady-in-waiting and right-hand woman to Tsarina Alexandra, to send Rasputin a telegram while he was in Siberia with a message to simply pray for her son. Rasputin wrote back shortly after receiving it, assuring Tsarina that God has seen your tears and heard your prayers. Do not grieve, the little one will not die. Do not allow the doctors to bother him too much. And now we get to the juicy details of why Rasputin was dubbed unkillable. The first single-handed attempt at killing him was by a 33-year-old peasant woman named Kayonia Guseva on July 12, 1914. After reading about him in the newspaper, she came to the conjecture that he was the Antichrist and a false prophet. She stabbed him in the stomach outside his home in Pakrovska, leaving a 14-inch long gash that exposed his organs. Rasputin had to have a local doctor perform an emergency surgery on him to save his life. The next assassination attempt, which we alluded to earlier, was simply because Felix Yusupov wanted Rasputin out of the picture for his own gain. And here's why. Rasputin's death meant Tsar Nicholas II would have the opportunity to make the royal family more powerful again because he'd be more influenced by his family and take their advice. Rasputin gone also meant that he could return from being away in the military and live in St. Petersburg to rule. It was December 30th, 1916. Yusupov invited Rasputin over and fed him cakes and wine that were poisoned with potassium cyanide. Rasputin was then shot three times, one of which was a close shot to the forehead and another in his heart. Yusupov's book, a memoir, recounts the experience like this. The devil who was dying of poison, who had a bullet in his heart, must have been raised from the dead by the powers of evil. There was something appalling and monstrous in his diabolical refusal to die. It took days for police to find his body because the river had frozen to sub-zero temperatures. Rasputin's legacy and political influence stretched far beyond his death. Tsar Nicholas II's decision to go to the front lines was mainly at Rasputin's behest because he was convinced that the Russian army would be nothing without his leadership in battle. Nicholas proved to be inept at war, so Rasputin was wrong in his conjecture. Rasputin's death also meant the Romanov dynasty's fate was extinction. Russia took an economic hit because the 15 million men who went to war meant a dip in their workforce and the food to subsist the soldiers could have gone to the citizens. Rasputin had been dead for over a year by the time of the Russian Revolution in 1917, but his influence was still strong. The royal family's influence, meanwhile, was in complete shambles. They were imprisoned for six months on house arrest, while the Bolshevik government that had taken over figured out what to do with them. Six months later, the royal family was killed by firing squad. Rasputin, what was seemingly just a small peasant, ended up being a force to be reckoned with and an influential part of history, and as you've gathered from today's episode, nearly immortal. This video was brought to you by Crystalborn Heroes of Fate, a free-to-play, fast-paced, dynamic RPG. Use our link in the description to download it on iOS and Android, and send a friend request to Infographics to start playing with us right now. Now it's time to become an immortal yourself, or at least a legend, by watching one of the two videos we've picked out just for you. Your time to choose is unfortunately limited though, so act fast and pick one now.